Well, today, obviously July 3rd, and tomorrow we celebrate July 4th. It's our, our nation's Independence Day. It's the day that we shoot fireworks. It's the day that we meet with family and friends. I can remember as a kid growing up, and I know many of you are, are much the same, shooting fireworks and blowing stuff up blowing myself up once or twice in the process, and uh, Carter was, uh, we bought some fireworks yesterday from Kevin Foote's fireworks stand located right around the corner, (laughs) right next to Dollar General, so he's not here, I just gave him a, I gave him a free plug, but anyway, we bought some fireworks, and as we're driving back to the house, Carter had this firework that he had bought, and he's reading the instructions on it, and it says, bury three quarters of the way into the ground and pack down the ground, tear off the paper, light the wick and get as far away as you can, aim it in the opposite direction of humans and animals and do not get anywhere near this explosive as it's going off. And I'm like, what are you reading? And he's like, it's a Roman candle. (laughs) And I said, uh, I said, Carter, there's two types of people in this world. There's the type of people that read the instructions on the fireworks and follow them to the T, and then there's the people that end up in the hospital. But either way, it's a lot of fun, right? So, but I can remember as a kid being, being the same way and, and, and playing with fireworks and having the occasional bottle rocket war when mom and dad weren't looking. And um, that was 25, 30, 35 years ago. And I think, for me especially, and I know for many of you probably as well, the fourth has a little bit of different feeling to it than it used to. We celebrate, the reason is the same. The way that we celebrate, shooting off fireworks and, and meeting with family, that's still pretty much the same. But much of the pride and patriotism that, that, was, that was so prominent for so many years... It just seems to be waning a little bit, going a little more dim. The question is why? Well, my answer this morning is that freedom is dying across our country at a very rapid rate. This year, obviously, is election year. There's a lot of big things on the line. There's a lot of big decisions that, that America's going to have to make. Choosing the next president's just one of them. Foreign affairs, health care, immigration, self-identification, gun control, religious liberties. All of these things are they're on the forefront of what's going to take place this, this coming election. In the direction that our country chooses to go thereafter. It seems like every day, and and this may just be me, but it seems like every day our freedoms as Americans, they come under more and more attack. I read an article, uh, and I'm sure uh, you guys have saw this uh, recently. It, It was an article of a gentleman who's being sued by his apartment complex because he chose to hang his American flag outside of his apartment complex through the month of June and July to celebrate our nation's freedom and our independence. He's being sued because he's wanting to fly an American flag on American soil. To me, that just doesn't make sense. Our freedoms are dying. Many would agree to that. However, there is a contingent of people that would disagree with that statement. There is a contingent of people that would argue and say, America has never been more free. Especially after the Supreme Court's decision a year ago. Yes, it's taken me this long to think of how I want to word this. 
They declared that same-sex marriages are now protected by all 50 states. No doubt, no doubt over the past year, countless pastors and countless churches have, have talked about and preached about and, and looked back over this decision that, that our country made and how it affects us of the Christian faith. Many, many Christians have, have been heartbroken over this. I think even more so have been confused by this decision. Maybe even scared about what this country has in store. Many of you know there was also a number of lawsuits that came about because of this decision. People being sued on what, on what we look at and we say, those weren't really grounds to be sued on. That's never going to hold up in court. It's never going to happen. They're never going to lose this case. It's not. And then we're dumbfounded after case, after case, after case. Or people who were simply living out their faith were victimized. Oh, how we have been mistaken on how we thought that would turn out. I have, um, I have strong opinions about those rulings. I have strong opinions about those decisions that were made. But let me just, let me just say this. Our country was founded on Christian principles and beliefs. Just because an institution is founded on a particular belief doesn't mean that it will always continue to maintain that belief. That's what we're seeing. It should also also go with that saying that just because that institution may change its beliefs... It doesn't mean that the principles themselves have changed. Let me, put it, let me put it another way. Our country was built and founded on Christian principles. Just because our country no longer adheres to those values, it doesn't mean that those principles have changed. As great as the United States of America is, It's not greater than God. And therefore, it cannot change what God's holy word says. Sin is sin. Be it robbery, murder, adultery, cussing, as we found out last week. Murder. Gluttony. A lifestyle choice. Changing the law to accommodate sin in any way does not change the fact that sin is still sin. We can reword the law as many times as we would like. It's not going to change things. We, we, and we also know that this isn't the first time, this isn't the first time that the law has failed to do what the law was supposed to do. The first time that we saw this was way back in the book of Exodus when God cast down the Ten Commandments. He set the precedents and mandates for what he wanted his chosen children to do and how to live. But as we know, as we've seen, as we've read, as the Old Testament played out, we saw that the law was ineffective to correct and bring about moral salvation. Couldn't do it. All the law could do was dictate behavior. It could not bring about a moral change in people's hearts. So that leads me back to my original statement. Freedom in America is dying. If we want to be um, brutally honest this morning, we would probably all admit that that's not just a case for America. That's pretty much the case for the entire world right now. We see this overall the deterioration of freedoms taking place. So the question on, on my mind, and, and, and I know the question on, on many of your minds would, would be this, when, when did freedom begin to die? When did this actually take place? Well, I hate to break it to you, but it didn't start with a court ruling a year ago. It didn't begin with that. 
It didn't begin with, with some poor decisions that our country has made over the last few decades. If we want to be really honest, it didn't even begin in our lifetime. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 8. And we're going to read about the time when freedom began to die. Many of you know Samuel. Samuel was a prophet of the Lord. Uh, he played a major role in, in biblical history, uh, prophesying, and, and, and he, he followed God unconditionally. Uh, God used him to bring about a king. But what you don't hear a lot about are Samuel's sons. Joel and Abijah. These two young men, they didn't necessarily follow in their father's footsteps. In fact, they turned and walked the other direction. They were still, um, they were still judges. They were still appointed as, as leaders over the people of Israel. But the Bible says that they turned away. They accepted dishonest gain, bribes. They perverted justice. It's because of this that the elders of Israel, they get to thinking and they're like, you know what, Samuel's getting old. At some point he's going to pass away and we're going to be left with these two boneheads, right? We've got to do something. We can't can't let these guys lead us. This isn't going to end well. And so we pick up 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 4 and following. Stand with me if you would as we read God's word this morning. It says that all the elders of Israel gathered together and they came to Samuel at Ramah and they said to him, behold, you're old. And your sons, they do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them according to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for This morning, God, I thank you for an awesome time of of worship, Lord. God, to hear your name lifted high, Lord, to celebrate our country's independence, Lord. God, we pray now as we study your word, Lord, as we discern your word. God, I pray that you would bring us clarity and that the words from my lips would not be mine, Lord, but they would be yours. We thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. The Israelites wanted a king. That's all they wanted. We just want a king. They wanted someone to, to look to. They wanted someone to look after to take care of. They wanted someone to go and fight their battles for them. All the things that their Heavenly Father was already doing for them. God's quick to explain to Samuel as as we read that that Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Don't, Don't take it, don't take it personal. He says that it's, it's me who they're choosing to refuse to follow. And the Lord tells Samuel, share a few words of warning to the people of Israel. Give them a, a heads up on what's about to take place. And we see that as I continue in verse 10. It says, so Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who are asking for a king from him. And he says, these will be the ways that the king who will reign over you, he will take your sons 
and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your male servants and your female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord, He will not answer on that day. What is God basically doing here? The, the, the best way that I can describe what, what's taking place in this, in this little exchange is that the rebellious children have went to the Father and said, we don't like the way things are, we want it to change. For those of you who have kids, kids can be rebellious. Kids, kids can think that they know everything. Uh, as a parent, it's our job to help guide and, and, and lead them in, in directions that, that is not going to allow them to get hurt too bad and, and try to help form some, some processing and, and some thinking as they do different things. And over, over the years, I have found myself getting eyes rolled at me because my kids will come up with something they want to do and I'll say, but if you do that this is going to be probably one of the consequences. Or if you choose to do this, you're probably going to get hurt. What am I trying to do? I'm not trying to be the, the, the big, bad, mean dad that doesn't let my kids have any fun. Did you hear that, Carter? What? I'm, trying to, I'm trying to warn my kids. That yes, you can do this. This is probably what's going to happen. And much like my own children, the Israelites go, uh-uh, we still, want it. we still want a king. We still want a king. We'll prove you wrong. Verse 19, nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us, that we, we may also be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And now after Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the Lord's hearing. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and appoint them a king. So Samuel said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. The day that God's chosen people ask for a human being to rule over them, Instead of loving and serving God himself, that was the day that our freedom started dying. It's because of this belligerence that we see in the Israelites to, to God's warning that began a very, very difficult period in their existence. They would soon see God's hand of judgment play out in a, in a very real way way. We here in America are not entirely unlike the Israelites, are we? How many times have we gambled with our freedoms? Could God be preparing to judge us in the same manner? Why do I say that? Why do I bring that up? As we have seen played throughout history in God's holy word, there are a few very, very important times that God makes himself very well known when he judges his people. Something that we need to pay attention to today. Number one, God will judge his people when they have become indifferent. 
You know, we've been talking on Sunday nights, we've been going through the Battle of the Bible uh, series, and, and, and we see throughout the Old Testament time and time again that the Israelites went through this period of ups and downs and ups and downs. They would do right, they would prosper, God would bless them, they would get to a point and they would go, we're doing pretty good for ourselves. We don't, we don't really need to focus as much on God. And they would start to fall away, and they would fall away, and they would fall away. And pretty soon God would say, you've fallen away from me. Now there's going to come some judgment. Now there's going to be some things happen. And they would, they would usually get overtaken by another people group, and they would become somewhat of a, of a slave-type people. And this would happen for any number of years. And then they would cry out to God, God, why is this happening? And God would go, you turned your back on me. You became indifferent about loving and serving me. And God would send a judge and he would, he would, he would release them and they, and they would prosper and they would, they would be blessed and everything would be great. And then as soon they would become indifferent again and they would fall away. And we see this cycle take place over and over and over. When God's children become indifferent to his will in their lives, he will judge them according to their hearts. How do we know this? Revelation three fourteen to 16. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Indifference. This warning to the church of Laodicea was, was coming to them because they had become indifferent when it came to their love for God and His sovereignty. The Bible tells us, if, if, if you read a little more in there, that, that they had become a wealthy people. They had basically reached a point where they, they kind of said, you know, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Things are going pretty well for us. We're pretty self-sufficient. We can, we can handle what's going on. What they didn't realize is that in their quote-unquote self-sufficiency, they had become pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, according to God's Word. This church, they thought that they were truly free in what they were doing. But in reality, they were slowly dying. You know, I've long since found it very interesting, and and, and it's just amazing how God's Word is, but the one verse in Scripture that that, that brings us the most hope, it brings us the most life, it brings us the most excitement is John 3.16. But it also has a counterpart the one that so many Christians struggle with throughout their lives in Revelation 3.16, being lukewarm Christians. For years, our country was considered a Christian nation. Every Sunday morning, millions of Christians would pile into churches. Some of those people came to worship Some of those people came because it was Sunday morning. That's just what you're supposed to do on Sunday morning. You go to church. Over the years, we have seen these numbers drop drastically. Why? So many people have become indifferent in their relationship with God. So many people over the years that have self-identified as Christians, while only a small percentage of them actually had born-again, saving relationship with Jesus Christ, what we're seeing is that those Christians, Christians, they're not around anymore. And you can say, well, that's a pretty bold statement. What gives you the right to say that? Well, I say look around. Not only our church, look around at any church.
the indifferent or fringe group of, of, of believers, the people that just came to be there on a Sunday morning, they're no longer simply coming into church because that's where you're supposed to be. In fact, it's went the entirely opposite direction. Those that used to be self-identifying Christians are now defying Christianity. They look at us as the bad guys the party poopers, so to speak, the ones that just want to cast judgment on everybody else. You know, I've made this statement before, and, and, and I, can't, I can't point this out enough. It used to be that the church was looked at as the moral compass for our country and, and for the world. People look to the church. What does the church think about the things that are going on? And that's not the case anymore. We are no longer the moral compass. We're the bad guys. Our country has become indifferent in how it views God. Number two, God will judge His people when they view Him as irrelevant. When we start to look that God, the creator of the universe, as some irrelevant thing, God's anger burns against us. Exodus, Moses, after leading the people across the Red Sea, and, and, and Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, he's gone for 40 days, he's basically getting the, the, the Ten Commandments, the Israelites begin to fear the worst. Moses is dead and God's gone. Just that quick, it's over. All is lost. So what do we do? Well, let's move on. Let's find something else to worship. Let's let's make a golden calf. That sounds reasonable. God saw this and he says to Moses, leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them. Obviously, Moses was able to to talk with God, and and, and God decides that he's not going to destroy the Israelites after all, but but we see here that the Lord's holy anger burned. After only 40, 40 days, the people had lost hope, they had lost direction, they forgot about this amazing deliverance that had just taken place from the Egyptians, they believed that Moses and the God that he had served had become irrelevant for their lives in the situation that they were in. They began to look for another God. And I can't, I can't help but wonder, have we, as His children in the year 2016, have we brought about the Lord's burning anger in our country? The things that, that nobody really wants to talk about. Abortions. Child trafficking. Murderous and profane lifestyles. Those are at an all-time high right now. Is the Lord's anger burning over us? If that's the case, if that is true, if that is our reality as a country, then there's no secret There's no secret to what's going to happen eventually. God's grace will turn to a grimace. His heartbreak will turn to heated anger, and His wrath will be upon us. When the Israelites viewed God as irrelevant and they sinned, they had Moses to stand in the gap for them, to intercede for them to speak on their behalf and and, 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 and talk to God for them. Who do we have in America? God will judge His people when they're indifferent. God will judge His people when they view Him as irrelevant. And God will judge His people when they ignore Him. 
You know, it's one thing, it's one thing to be indifferent or to view God um, as irrelevant. Uh, you, you either don't have strong feelings one way or the other, or, or you, you either do or you don't believe that God is who He says that He is. It, it, it's, one thing, it's one thing to look at it from that perspective. It's something entirely different when you know who God is, yet you choose to simply ignore Him. How can I explain this? Well, let's see. Let's say you're hollering for your kid who's in the other room. And you say, come in here real quick. And you get no reply, no response. They don't come in. And you say, hey, come here real quick. Nothing happens. And you walk into the room. And you look to him and you say, did you hear me hollering for you? If they say, oh, no, I, I didn't hear you. I, I, didn't, I wasn't paying attention, sorry. You have maybe a little more pity for them and, and you, don't, you don't spank them right there, right? But if they say, yeah, I heard you. What are they really saying? I heard you, but I didn't care enough to get up and I didn't care enough to even answer you. Does your anger not burn? Does their rear end not then burn afterwards? When God's children choose to ignore Him, His reaction, His reaction is no different than ours. Our anger is going to burn. He may not immediately cast down the consequences and the judgment for our actions, but He will remove His hand of protection from us. There are a large majority of Christians in this country that believe that's already happened. Deuteronomy 8, 19 to 20 says this, If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. Did you catch what was just said? When we as the children of God start acting like the other nations who are detestable to the Lord, we are no different than them. And He will destroy us. For so, for so many years, our nation, we, we, we look to God for, for wisdom and direction. However, at this point in time, it appears as though due to popular demand, we as a nation have chosen to ignore God and His guidance. Just like the Israelites in, in 1 Samuel, the time has come where our nation is looking for someone else to rule over us. We want someone else to rule over us. It may not necessarily be an individual or, or even a president. It may not be a state. It may not be a country. It may not be a government. I believe that this new leader that, that the world, that the country is looking for is a new kind of God, and it's the God of free will. Not that free will is a bad thing. What we're talking about here is the type of will that says, I should be able to do whatever I want to do and live however I want to live. Don't put restraints on me. Don't hold me back. I want to do what I want to do. If humans were given that freedom, we would destroy ourselves in one generation. We would be done. We're sinful. We're selfish. Can I, share, can I share a reality with you this morning that it's not in my notes. Here, here's the reality this morning. True freedom for all doesn't really exist. It can't. Why? Because if you have two people in a room, you're going to have two different opinions on what they should be able to do. Eventually, those freedoms are going to trample on the other one's freedoms, and they're going to cry, well, I'm not totally free because what you believe doesn't allow me to be free. It can't work. The only true freedom that exists ever 
is the freedom that you receive when you believe in Jesus Christ and you ask forgiveness of your sins. That is the only true and real freedom that you will ever know on this planet. Thanks, Jason. Right? Some of you are going, thanks, appreciate it. Came to church this morning to have a nice patriotic 4th of July service, and this is what we get. I'm here this morning not, not only to, to share with you what I believe God's word was for this morning, but also to give you hope. In what appears may be our, our country's darkest hour, I'm here to also share with you the hope that I think God has for you. Yes, the times are changing. Yes, our country is changing. Our churches are changing. But the one thing that does not and will not ever change is the very nature of who God is and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. That will never change. To overcome this war, this, this battle that we're in, we have to be willing to invite. And some of you are going, I'll start inviting people. That's not what I'm talking about. We have to be willing to invite God. We have to pray and intercede on behalf of our government, much like Moses did when the Israelites were worshiping their golden calf. We have to go to God on behalf of our nation, on behalf of the human race, that God will once again place His hand of protection over us. We must be willing to increase. Increase our efforts to show God's love to a lost and dying world. We as Christians have to continually push for what is right in God's eyes. Even if the law disagrees. Even if it causes friction even if it causes persecution, and it will. We must be willing to invest. We must decide that our lives, that we dedicate our lives to what we know is right, regardless of the outcome or the consequences. We have to stand in the gap of indifference and sway the vote towards God. And I warn you, you're going to be called intolerant. You're going to be called arrogant. You're going to be called a hypocrite. You're going to be called judgmental. You'll be ridiculed and persecuted for the things that you think and the things that you say. We've known this is going to happen for a long, long time. While our freedoms as Americans they still remain somewhat free at this point. Somewhat. Our freedoms as Christians has long since expired in this country and many others. Look at how we are persecuted across the world. In closing this morning, I'm going to ask that Josh would come up and get ready for invitation. Throughout the years, so many of our loved ones and, and family members, they have, they have fought, they have bled, and they have died for this flag, not knowing what the outcome of the battle will be. But they fought still. This morning, ladies and gentlemen, we have a battle in front of us, but guess what? We know who wins at the end. We know that the things that we have suffered and will suffer for and, and, and will die for, we know that we know in the end that it, it's not in vain. We know that there is a meaning, there's a purpose. I'm going to leave you with this this morning. The courts may change the laws and a great number of things by their rulings. But our first and primary call as a Christian will never change. We are to love the lost and tell them about Jesus, regardless of what our 
country or our government says. Just like a soldier who is given orders and is to fulfill those orders, we have been given orders as Christians. Love the lost, tell them about Jesus. Stand with me this morning as we pray and as we have our time of invitation. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I do thank you for this great nation. Lord God, for the freedoms that we do still have, Lord, and for the way that you have blessed the United States so greatly over the years. But Lord, I, like so many other Americans, Lord, whether, whether they are Christians or not, Lord, we see a, a shift taking place in this country. Lord, my prayer this morning is that regardless of who is humanly in charge, Lord, regardless of who makes the decisions, Lord God, my prayer is that we who are your followers, Lord, we who are your children, that through it all, Lord, we would trust you, that we would obey you, Lord, and that we would simply love the lost and share the gospel with them even unto death. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time of study, Lord. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will move mightily in this time of invitation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come forward this morning as the Spirit leads you.